And all right, good afternoon, because this is an afternoon lunch date. How are you doing, Lauren? I'm doing okay. How are you? Man, uh, I am still adjusting, as I have been, you know, for the last three or four weeks. You know, there's it's a never-ending story of adjustment, because every day something changes. <laughs> so true. The days stay the same, like you couldn't tell Sunday from Thursday anymore, but the whatever ball of crap that gets thrown to you every day is a different ball of crap every day. Very true. That's very true. <laughs> How are you doing? We're doing okay. Yeah, so I have two, two little kids at home, a three-year-old and a six-year-old, both boys, both totally rambunctious. Um, and then my husband is a private practicing attorney as well. So he's busier than ever because he does insurance coverage and is handling COVID claims for businesses. So all these, you know, business closure claims are coming to his clients, the insurance companies, and he's working on uh, coverage opinions for those. And so that's uh, been keeping him really busy. And then of course, with my work, we're doing really well as a company. We sell downloadable digital software. So that's what everyone's using these days. Right. And so for us, um, business is going well, but it does mean it's been really busy. And then you throw the two kids into that mix. And the only thing that's holding us together is our nanny, Edna. <laughs> I'd say she's the glue that, that holds it all together. Otherwise it would not be possible. Well, you've hit on several things I want to talk about, but before we jump into those, I want to make sure everybody knows who you are, because I've now known you for quite a while now, since the very yeah. beginning of your I career. Baby lawyer. <laughs> yes, I just was talking about that with Alexis, too. I'm like, I got a lot of baby lawyers who are very grown yeah. now, um, which, you know, is, is a very rewarding feeling uh, to have, especially when they're grown and they're doing really, really well. But by all means, please tell everybody a little bit about yourself, what you do and about your company, because I want to know more. I mean, I, I did some research, so I know more, but I, I don't think everybody knows what Clever Bridge does. So. Sure. Um, so again, my name is Lauren Schwartz and I am the general counsel of Clever Bridge. Um, I am the general counsel of the Chicago office, which is, um, has been here for about 15 years or so. And we are a teenage startup specializes in providing e-commerce solutions for clients who sell primarily downloadable digital software. Um, for example, antiviral software, VPN connections, video conferencing tools, things like that. And what we provide is a full platform experience. So we are a reseller of these goods. Um, and through that, we provide a shopping cart that integrates with our clients' websites where we handle the payment processing, including credit card processing. We calculate sales tax. We run the anti-fraud screenings and import-export compliance screenings and handle all of the customer service with regards to the sale itself of the item. And then we have another arm of our business that provides digital marketing services. So those are things like SEO optimization, things like um, providing cart abandonment campaigns. Like when you buy, go to buy something online, you stick it in your cart and then you don't do anything about it. You get that email that's like, hey, did you forget something? Those types right. of things. Um, and other types of online marketing to help promote our clients' products, um, irrespective of whether we sell them. Um, and then we also have a financial uh, payment service provider model, a financial institution over in Germany that has our German banking license um, to use to process payments um, where our clients will actually stay the merchant of record rather than us being the merchant of record. So several arms to the business and uh, a lot going on. That, you know, you sound so like comfortable saying all that stuff. You know? <laughs> I may have said it a time or two. <laughs> well, of course, and, but it, and it's a lot to say and it's, you know, it's a kind of a diverse, I mean, you know, you, you've got it packaged nicely, but it's a diverse set of offerings. It is, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a pretty, it's a full solution for sure. All right, now I got to get you a little bit. So tell us a little bit more about Lauren. Because that's about a clever bridge, but a little me. bit more about Lauren. Where do you live? We know you're married and you have two kids and you yep. have a nanny. Married with two just kids. some fun things about you. Sure. So we live on the north side of Chicago up in um, a neighborhood called North Center. And uh, we've been up here for a couple of years. Been in Chicago for 14 years. Uh, we got married in 06 and I started law school about three weeks after we got married um, at Northwestern. So we've been here ever since. 
Um, I'm originally from about two hours south of Chicago, a small rural community called Pontiac. It's only about 10,000 people in the whole town, probably less now. Um, so very different from, from the city life that we live now. Um, what else can I tell you? I'm part French, so um, I speak French fluently and we go back to France regularly to see my family which we were supposed to do this fall, and it's looking like we're not gonna be able to do that um, right. with all of the, the current uh, COVID crisis. Um, I am a yoga enthusiast. It's a big part of my yeah, life, yeah. as is physical fitness in general, something that I really enjoy. Um, I'm an avid gardener, which I'm getting ready. My plants are arriving in 10 days, so I'm super excited to get those in the ground. Um, and I'm also an amateur handy woman, so I will take on any home improvement project possible. I can do minor electrical, minor plumbing, um, and that's sort of my happy place. I re recently got my first power saw, like a circular, it's a small circular hand saw, um, just to cut two by fours and stuff. And uh, I'm in my element if I've got my, my hands either in the dirt or like on metal or wood or something like that. So since you're home a lot more, it looks like you're probably in your bedroom, I'm guessing. I am. So I'm home officing. This is super professional here. Home okay. officing in my master bedroom. Uh, my husband is in our, we, our actual home office is in our basement, um, which is our office slash guest room. And um, my husband is officing there because the kids are doing most of their work in the basement. Plus, that's where the rec room is where they play and take their breaks. And it is loud. They are just loud all the time. Um, and so for me, because we, I work for an international company, we're headquartered, um, or actually the Inc's headquarters is in Chicago, but then the company, the Inc is owned by our German parent company, which is the AG that's in Cologne, Germany. And so I spend most of my mornings on Zoom calls already. I mean, even before all of this, um, I would spend my entire morning on Zoom calls with, uh, with my German counterparts, um, taking advantage of the time change. And so for me, I just can't have all the noise in the background yeah. and all that. My husband can just put on headphones and work and he doesn't have as many conference calls. So he's down there. I'm up here, which is two floors above and on the opposite side of the house away from the kids, about as far away as I can get from the noise. And the bedroom was the best option. So sacrificing a little bit of professionalism just to uh, get the work done and not have it be as interrupted. <laughs> It looks great, and it, it brings up something I wanted to check in with you because I haven't talked to anybody about this. So I remember a point in my career where I had a lot of clients in Germany. Um, actually, maybe like might have been before you joined Kirkland, but uh, right around like I think the early two thousand, and I had a lot of I had a client that was headquartered in Germany, and uh, you know had several subsidiaries that were all in Germany. They had of course U.S. subsidiaries as well, and uh, it's exhausting because they're seven hours ahead of you most of the time. So when you get up, and I'm an early riser, I'm up at five o'clock in the morning, but when I get up at five o'clock in the morning, they have been up for several hours <laughs> and there'd be a bunch of emails waiting for me. And yeah, a bunch of requests for calls. And you'd spend like a big chunk of your morning responding to their yesterday, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, which can be like exhausting. You feel like you're, you always feel like you're behind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's how I start getting up so early, to be honest with you. There's a point in my career where I was always waking up feeling behind. So I was like, Jamal, you got to, and that was when I was getting up at like maybe six or seven. So then I'm like, yeah. well, you just got to start getting up earlier because you're never going to get ahead and it's carried yeah. for, you know, many, many years. But how do you deal with that? So I'm lucky in a few respects. The first is that part of my team is in Germany. So um, the nice thing about our legal department is we have a presence in both Germany and the U.S. So we have almost 24 hour coverage. You know, so we try to take advantage of the time change by then. So you know, by the time I get up, Somebody on my team is typically dealt with most of, you know, the tr if there's anything, it's a true emergency. The second part for me is, is somewhat just a mental switch. You know, I, I, I try not to look at it as I'm behind. I try to look at it as, you know, there's a certain amount of progress that's, that's been made and I can sort of take advantage of the fact that they've had a few hours to sit with this and work with it before, um, before I'm necessarily getting involved. And, Sometimes you'll follow the email thread and realize they looped me in and it wasn't a legal question after all. And they already got it resolved and I don't have to do anything. So, um, so sometimes it can actually play to our advantage. Um, and then the third thing for us is culture is really important at Cleverbridge. 
um, which can't be underestimated. And so it's culture between the, the various offices trying to make sure that we understand the cultural differences between Germany and the US. We also have offices in Asia, in, in Japan and in Taipei as well. Understanding all those cultural differences is really important so that we can get a feel for how each office operates or works. Sometimes Germans may have a very direct way of saying things that might offend somebody in the US if you don't understand that that's just the way Germans speak sometimes and it's not meant you know, with any malice at all. Whereas um, in the US, sometimes our German counterparts will look at um, some of the, you know, the, the higher salaries that US employees earn um, and some of the flexibility that we have. But then usually we have to sort of educate them on the fact that, well, we have fewer social safety nets in the US, right? And we have fewer employment protections. It's at will employment. So, you know, I can be fired for good, bad, or no reason at all. Um, and as long as it's not a super bad reason, you know, there, there's nothing to, to protect me against that. It's, it's part of the basis of the bargain. Um, and so some, you know, being really vocal about those differences and sensitive to them, like, and that's just a couple examples of the numerous differences, is really important. And um, one of them is certainly time change. And so everybody is very sensitive to the fact that there is this lag time between the two offices. We don't want people working around the clock. We don't want people working you know, 60, 80 hour weeks. In fact, in Germany, there are very tight restrictions against that. We would have to pay some serious overtime for, for huge hours. So that's something that you know, it's not necessary and nor do we want it for the sanity of our workers. So people are pretty sensitive to, to those time differences. And you know, as in my role as any lawyer, I have to be available and I, I let people know that look, you know, regularly I can join a call at eight, that's not a problem. If it needs to be seven or 7.30, I can make it work as long as it's not you know, on a super uh, regular basis and as long as I have notice. So if somebody sets a 7 a.m. call for me and I just got up at six or 6.30 with my boys, I'm gonna decline that call unless it's a true emergency. Um, and so that's one way where you know, I, I try not to feel behind the ball because I have to be able to manage my own schedule. And so my former boss, when I was at Groupon would always tell me, you know, we're not ER doctors. Like we are not out there saving lives. There are very few emergencies that happen in our sphere of practice. And when they happen, we know what they are. Like we know it when we see it. Look, if, if someone says we've had a data breach and I need you to get on a 7 a.m. call and I just, you know, stepped out of bed at 6.30, yes, I will be on that 7 a.m. call. Um, but if it's just a run-of-the-mill issue, even if it's client pressure, right? Um, you know, you gotta you gotta respect your own boundaries and and set them and have others respect them. Because if you don't respect them, nobody else is going to. Amen to that. I agree 100%. Um, so let, let let's dig into this because um, I get it, and um, a lot of people I think think they get it. But you know, the role of a general counsel, like people. A lot of times don't get what a general counsel is um, and they and, and it varies in organizations. I've never actually been a general counsel. I've been like regional counsel at IBM, mm -hmm. which is as big as IBM is like general counsel for this this section, you know, Yeah, your section Midwest. probably had more employees than my entire company. Has. <laughs> well, you know, right. But, you know, but, you know, but but the role that you play, some people think like, you know, are you exclusively sell, settling legal problems? Are you doing a lot of business stuff? Are you, you know, that kind of stuff? Well, I think people don't understand what GCs do. So I'd love you to tell me a little bit like, what's the GC like, GC life like for you? Yeah, it's definitely a mix. Um, I would say my primary responsibility is on legal issues. But what legal issues are is a total gray zone. Right? It's a mix of straight up you know, law and legal advice, but it always has to take into account the business and it has to take into account the risk profile, right? And how much risk are we willing to bear versus a potential return on taking that risk. Uh, and so that involves, that it requires that we are knowledgeable about the business, about the intimate details, even, you know, the financial numbers of the business, because you have to know, okay, so a client wants us to make this concession for a contract and, you know, the projected revenue is X and you got to know how that compares to, you know, the rest of 
um, of the client base and is that something that's willing to take you're willing to take a risk on or is it something where you're willing to have a prospect walk away you have to understand the full context of the business picture um, in order to to make those decisions and then certainly we're brought in on issues that, that aren't really purely legal but you know people just want to know like what do you think about this from a business perspective or what do you think you know, is this a good idea, bad idea? What direction should we head in this? Just because as you earn your position as a trusted advisor, that extends far beyond the traditional legal analysis as well. Right. What's it like um, working with the rest of people in the C-suite? You know, um, do you see yourself as a, they see you as a value add, they see you as a cost center, you know, is it a hybrid of both? Certainly a value add. And um, I think part of the difference uh, is that we don't have a lot of litigation, some, um, most of which, for you. yeah, I know, right? And most of which we've brought ourselves, so <laughs> it's not, <laughs> so we kind of only have ourselves to blame for that. Uh, no, but we, we have very little litigation. Um, and when I was at Groupon, for example, I was the head of global IP litigation there. There, I was a cost center, and I felt like a cost center, right? And no matter how many times you save the company from a certain level of exposure or risk, it's a very different, um, it, it's a very different positioning to say, oh, we spent three million in legal fees over you know, the three years of this case, but it could have been way worse if we hadn't succeeded, right? And right. That's a hard, you know, and, and, and we all, you understand it as a litigator, you get that that's, that's the life that we have. Um, and fortunately, when I was at Groupon, um, they all, you know, the business people all understood that and, and it was very well supported throughout the organization. But it's a different posture versus now being involved with closing big clients that are bringing revenue directly into the company. I can look at that and say, you know, I did that. Like I helped to bring that revenue in. Not that I'm the one out there pounding the pavement, bringing the prospects in, but once those prospects came in, I got it done, right? I got it signed. Yeah. Um, and that's a, that's a much different feeling. And that feels much more like a value add. And part of it too is, is the way that you render advice. I mean, if people come to you for permission for new things, which you don't really want that to be the posture to begin with, but if that's how they come to you and you're always saying no, they're, not, they're either not gonna come to you anymore, you're gonna get cut out, right. or certainly they're not going to see you as a value add, they're gonna see you as this necessary obstacle they have to get over in order to get what they want. As opposed to if you take the approach of, you know, what is it exactly that you want to do? What's the ultimate goal here? What are we trying to achieve? And if we can't do it in this way, then rather than say no, the answer should never be no, it should be right. no, but right. here's how we can get to that result or here's how we can get to something close to it. Um, and sometimes it'll be a yes and, you know, yes, and we need to tweak it this way just a little bit, right? And, but as, as long as you're coming up with solutions and showing your business partners that you understand what the goals are, we're all in this together. We all want the company to succeed and you're not just trying to put up roadblocks, then they will see you as a value add because you are at that point adding value. Yeah, no, I, I, um, I love that because I remember when I was at IBM and I don't know if this was the true beginning, but it was part of a major shift in how um, inside council worked with uh, the business. And it was mm -hmm. a shift from this at one point was clearly a traditional, the legal office was viewed as a no place, yeah. like regulatory check the box. If you don't check all the right boxes, mm -hmm. the answer was no, legal be like, no, come back. No, yeah, come no, back. go figure it out and come right. back when you have something else. Right, to, to really a very intentional, um, you trying to get to yes, that whole getting to yes philosophy. I remember our office had gotten to the point where like our answer were, you know, we didn't even do, it was always gonna be, the answer was always gonna start with a yes. Yeah. So even if it was a horrible deal, even if it was like, you know, yes, however, or yes, and, or yes, but yes, if you do this, this, and that, like, yes, we will absolutely take this concession if, however, yeah. the revenue is going to be uh -huh. this, yep. and you're going to have Or we get this other thing in, in return, yeah. this other protection, or, yeah. Yeah, 
But yeah, I always like to say the, that the answer is yes, unless it's something super illegal, <laughs> then, right? And, and, you know, we're fortunate the types of companies that we work with and work for, you know, that's not an issue. No one's asking right. anything super illegal. Um, but yeah, I mean, there, there are very few things, um, and I can't, I struggle to even think of any, where it just has to be a, a hard no. Um, and I think that if you're about to give a hard no, you're not thinking hard enough about whatever right. about the issue or you don't understand it well enough it's really how everybody you know just whether it's legal or business or whatever it is like that's really how we ought to approach our transactions yeah. discussions yeah. whatever you know a way to say you know to really like i i've become a really big proponent now of consensus like a way and consensus is not compromise and then people think compromise okay well if i get you know no consensus is let's have enough conversation let's make enough effort to get to a point where we all can say yes to something, right? We all can feel comfortable about what the end result is. And, you know, and, and that's a, a very yes focused approach. Like, e even if the yes is gonna be yes, we're not gonna do this. We're all gonna be like comfortable with that being the answer because everybody's yeah. been heard, everybody's contributed. Um, we're not approaching this as a how to tank this, we're approaching this as a how to make this work so, um, scenario. So um, I'm glad we talked about that. Yeah. Yeah. It's the, you're right. It's the way that we all should be approaching things. And in particular, I mean, business people, everyone should be approaching it that way. And one thing that I find that's interesting and also disappointing is it seems like you don't, as a lawyer, learn to think that way until you've been in-house, right? Which is why now in your private practice, you're positioned in a really interesting way of having that experience because all lawyers should be operating in that way, whether they're in-house or outside. And it just doesn't seem to happen. And it, it, you end up in this position where as in-house counsel, you oftentimes start to feel, especially if it's litigation, um, you start to feel almost like your adversary to your <laughs> lawyers, yes. your outside counsel, because you're constantly saying, look, they, our company can tolerate some risk. Like, so let's think, creatively here and they're just right. sort of it's like cya you know yes it must be locked down and there are no exceptions like, oh man lawyers are inherently risky i think i mean the yeah. i think the ideal experience for most lawyers if they can get it and you know me being at the i'm at kind of the end of my legal career now because i'm trying mm -hmm. to retire that part yeah. so if i had to give advice to people like in the back i'd say hey if you can take like, you know, even if it's a year or two, like, cause in-house job, there's a trade-off. Sometimes you have better work-life balance. You might make less money. <laughs> you will but, make less money. <laughs> you may, I mean, you know, right. You, you often will. I mean, there's, there's some, I've, you know, there are some in-house yeah. jobs that I'll pay really well. And, um, but, but the experience is so invaluable because it's the first time as a lawyer where you have to really become a part of a business team yeah. and have to think about the business when you're outside the business is billable hours and profits per partner. That's the business. <laughs> yeah, know? I wish that people would, would take more advantage of, um, of an opportunity to go in-house, whether it's through a secondment, which you're seeing. Right. You know, we used um, seconded attorneys a few times at Groupon to fill maternity leave vacancies or things like that. Um, or whether it's just leaving a law firm for a little while and going in-house for one, two, three years. And then going back out, because as I'm sure you found, I did that. once you've been in, you're super marketable if you want to come back out, you know, and I think people just get so afraid of leaving something that's working well enough or working okay, um, whereas law firms, you know, are and should be really supportive of their people moving in-house and then coming back, and <laughs> so... And they are, they are. And it's so one thing, yeah. like if I said, you know, whether it be a government job, I mean, honestly, and for, I'd say this to, to many women and the many minority young lawyers who are struggling with, uh, and you know, the law firm lifestyle, mm -hmm. want to be partner and want to be successful. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you, if you, you know, there are many paths, to, not many, but there are few paths to partnership in a firm. There's a few paths to success in any business, but you know, one of them is all about the work and all about yep. the money. Like if you build a lot of hours and you do a lot of great work, then the firm's gonna love you, they're probably gonna promote you and that's just whatever, because at the end of the day, you're putting money in their pocket. But the other is, you know, if you can build those relationships um, where you have clients who spend the money 
you know, but the only way you get those relationships is if the clients like you. And the only way they're going to like you is if you actually understand what their life is like. So taking a job where you can actually do that, going in house and having that experience where you see what it's like to be, you know, a client, what it's like to actually have to manage a business team where your billable hours is not the number one priority for anybody to talk about, you know, yeah. Um, unless there's a problem, then, then there's a conversation to be had. Um, it really can help you skip a couple of years of kind of grunt work and really fast forward your career um, if you decide you want to go back into private practice. Because when you go back and you can say, hey, I've been in the house, I know how this works. I might even know a client or two that might hire me because they know I know their business. The conversation is a whole lot different when you're saying, hey, I want to be a partner. Then yeah. if you're like, hey, I just got like six, seven years of really good billable hours. Right. Know? Yeah, totally. Everybody can do that. You know, so. Yeah. Um, so let me ask you this, because I know you're in the fitness before I get into my last three things. Um, how are you keeping up with your fitness uh, routines and things like that? Because I am still struggling. <laughs> you know, like I cannot yeah. motivate myself to work out at home. Yeah, I'm lucky that I've always been, or at least for a long time, I've been someone who works out at home. Um, I'm not a runner. I hate running and I don't do it on a treadmill or outside or in any way, shape or form. Um, I've always really enjoyed the elliptical trainer and weight training. So when my first, when I was pregnant with my first son, um, my husband and I invested in putting a home gym into our house. At our old house, we took a kind of a spare room in the basement um, and converted that into a home gym and gave up our gym membership. And, and so I've worked at home, uh, worked out from home ever since. And then um, I also recently started a circuit training app, like maybe in January or February, that's all at home workouts too on the app. And so I was already kind of in that groove when this all hit. So my workout routine really hasn't changed. And my yoga studio that I normally, I'll sneak away when I'm in the office, I'll sneak away over lunch two or three days a week and take a, an hour long yoga class at a studio that's just a block away from our office. Um, and so since all of this hit, the studio has gone virtual and has virtual classes uh, every day at various times. And so I've been keeping up with taking two or three virtual classes a week. Um, and they offer them on the weekends too, which I hope they'll continue to do because I don't go downtown to, to go to the yoga studio on the weekends, but I would sign into a virtual class if I could. So the fitness part has been, um, has been okay just because my fitness routine is at home. It's, it's had to get shifted a little bit from time to time. You know, maybe instead of stepping away over lunch, I'll step away at four o'clock to do a workout or, you know, I'm trying to take advantage of the flexibility in time. Um, but it's, it's definitely something that I have had to continue to make a priority and try not to slack off on just for my mental wellness. You know, I just feel better. I just feel more alert and more awake and, um, and stronger. And it gives me some natural definitions to my day and to my time, you know, by kind of sticking with that normal routine. Man, uh, you're my inspiration because, <laughs> you know, I just... I have, you know, I managed to get up every day and I think I'm going to tweak this week because I, you know, was struggling trying to repeat or recreate what I had. And that's just not working for me because I do really like the equipment at the gym. I do a lot of weightlifting. So I need like, I, you know, I can't, you know, home dumbbells, like they max out, you know, yeah. where I'm starting now. So, um, but you know, what I have gotten good at is getting up in the morning and doing my cardio sometimes with my son. Um, yeah. which has been uh, encouraging for me because yeah. you know, I'm, not, I'm not pumping it out like I normally would, but I'm getting in the cardio, but I'm also feeling good about it because I'm helping him. You know, I'm yeah. teaching him and it makes me feel good. So I think what I'm going to start doing now is just getting up in the mornings and just doing light stuff like cardio, go for a run or yeah. you know, go for a long walk or whatever. And then in the afternoon, like to kind of make sure I cap my day and don't like continue working into the wee hours of the night just say like around four o'clock, 4.30, I'm going to stop and I'm going to go actually like go in my garage and maybe do like some calisthenics, some, you know, push-ups, the little yeah. weights I do have, like some more muscle me weight when I, you know, you know, kind of need that second break or second yeah. win. There, and it's, it's a good opportunity to maybe find something else that speaks to you outside of your gym routine. So, you know, maybe try a few virtual yoga classes or Pilates classes or, 
do um, you know find some dynamic stretching routines because if you're building a lot of muscle that muscle also has to be able to be flexible and stretch um, so it's a time to focus on that without feeling guilty without feeling like oh I didn't really get a good workout you might find that it has benefits that you know, actually that's a brilliant Thank you, because yeah. you know I tried yoga. I tried yoga once before, and I actually did enjoy it. Um, I had some online. I think Grokker or somebody like that had done these great little courses that I got through, like my then Comcast, non-cast uh, <laughs> system. And uh, you know, but I, I I stopped doing it because I was trying to balance getting to the gym, and in terms of yeah, what I perceived to be the return. I'm like, you know, yeah. I'm going to the gym, and I can yeah, the ROI wasn't wasn't yeah. there. But right. now you have permission. But now I can't. Yeah. yeah. Because especially if it's the ROI becomes a lot different if it's between that and nothing, right? And, or and that and, and day, something I'm, ineffective. I'm getting old and I am like, I've had two rounds of physical therapy because muscles have been tight and, you know, yep. that kind of stuff. So maybe I need, you know, I need the flexibility. I know And I the right that. class will be challenging and will build muscle. And like, for me, one thing that's really helped um, that I actually got this from Alexis, from uh, her Facebook and LinkedIn feed was having a goal that you're working towards. And so one of my goals that I was inspired by her for was handstands. You know, I used to do handstands before I had babies um, and then I kind of got away from it. And so now I, you know, not every day, but every few days I'll do a handstand just on the wall and then take one foot away and then take the other and then, <laughs> and then I'm down, but try, try to see, can I stay up for one more second? Yeah. Um, and then the other thing is I'm, I'm working on push-ups. Like historically I've not had great, great up, uh, pec muscles, shoulders, this area has not been the strongest. Uh, but since doing yoga and a lot of chaturangas, um, I found that I can tell that I, I can do it much better with much better form. And I've been able to make incremental gains in my yoga practice. So I was like, oh, maybe I'll try some push-ups now. And I was like, oh, I can actually do a couple. Oh, maybe I should start like trying to see how many I can do. And so um, just having those kinds of goals which, you know, no equipment needed. It's just my body. Um, and so you can still find ways of, of making it valuable and learning something new and still getting a really good workout too. I'm actually going to like, yeah, that's, that's actually going to be my morning switch instead of I'll do a couple of days of cardio running or whatever. And then I'll do a couple yeah. of days of yoga because, you know, that's better than nothing. And it, quite frankly, sure. I need it, you know, yeah. so you yeah. solved the problem for me. Thank you what I'm here for. <laughs> All right, before we let you go, I have three things I've been trying to be more focused uh, with these and trying to get some information out of it that I think is meaningful to me, but I think it's meaningful to everyone else as well. Um, and um, they are this, how are you growing? No, sorry, how are you coping through this? How are you growing through this? And then what is your plan to carry what you've learned forward? So whatever it is that you feel like you've learned in coping and growing. So start with number one, how are you coping? Uh, just with this whole being stuck in your house and, you know, you know, you're, I mean, I know you love your kids. I mean, I love my kid too, but man, I, you know, I, you know, other than when he was an infant, I never saw him as much, you know? Yeah. No kidding. Right. It's like, for me, it's like maternity leave all over again, except for right. talk. <laughs> exactly. somebody, somebody posted a meme recently that said being quarantined with a chatty toddler is like having an insane parrot super glued to your shoulder all day. <laughs> it's, it's kind of accurate. Um, how am I coping? Um, a few things. One, I'm being selfish. So I'm deciding when, you know, if I need to go to bed early, if the boys are already in bed, then I'm going to bed early. If I need some outdoor time and I need to step away from work for a little bit to go have a little outdoor time, I go have some outdoor time in our yard or, you know, sit out, um, and take a call outside. Um, if I really, you know, don't want to play with the boys that game we've played a thousand times and I want to go get a workout in instead and my husband can take the boy duty, I go do that without any guilt. Just say, you know, like I have to put on my own oxygen mask before assisting others. So for me, it's, it's been about the things that have really helped me is getting outside when I need to, sleep and physical fitness. And of course the occasional glass of wine. <laughs> or more than occasional glass of wine. So. Life is more fun with wine in it. Yeah, totally, totally. All right, and so, you know, you're coping well. Actually, I, I feel like I picked up some, some, some tips from that because I think people, selfish has a negative connotation to it, 
But at the end of the day, it's what we really all ought to do because taking care of yourself is a necessity if you're going to take care of anybody else. You're just not going to be any good. You will burn out like a light bulb, you know, really quickly if you take care of everybody else and you don't take care of yourself. Right. So it's not really negative to be selfish. It's actually generous because it means you'll be around longer to help the people you care about if you mm-hmm. take good care of yourself. So I love that. All right. How are you growing? What 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 do you think is this experience is causing you to 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 stretch, grow, you know, inspire? How, you know, how is it bringing something new out of you? Because I know it is. Yeah, I think that there are a few things. So one is that you know, like I talked about some of those fitness goals that I have. It's brought out um, you know a few just kind of personal again selfish goals that I'm working towards um, on being able to do handstands and those types of things, um, which. Are, are just things that I would have put off before. Like I wouldn't have thought about it before, but now that life is busier in some ways, but way less busy in others, I feel like I have permission to, to focus on some of those things. And I want to see uh, something come out of this that I've, <laughs> that I've done. Um, but I think more so um, the, the ways that I'm seeing myself grow are more interpersonal. So one is with my boys having the opportunity to really see what they learn and how they learn, even though I'm not the one administering the homeschool all the time, you know, we're, my husband and I are still involved in it and still will step away to do certain lessons or certain things. And so, you know, my older son has pretty pronounced ADHD and some other behavioral special needs that he has a lot of accommodations for in school, which is also why I can't thank my nanny enough because she's now become a special ed teacher without, you know, the training for it or ever having signed up for that. Um, And so to see the way that he both struggles and triumphs and get a more detailed understanding of that has been invaluable for me in terms of being able to grow as a parent and be able to help him and be able to tailor his treatments, his medications, his supports, all of those things that we have heard about over the years from his teachers, we can now see it directly and have more of a, an educated stance on what he needs. Um, and it's also giving us permission, since he's not really interacting with many humans these days, to try out some new things, to try out some new parenting techniques, some new methods, um, like one of which is ignoring certain behaviors that that ordinarily would just be on him for because you can't do that around people. You, you just can't, you can't do that at school. You can't do that around people. But now that we're not around people, maybe we ignore it and kind of take this radical, you know, approach to just not saying anything when he says super weird stuff, maybe it'll go away. Maybe it won't, but it will just be back where we were before. I mean, no harm, no foul, but maybe it actually, you know, it, it'll actually stop. So gives us an opportunity to try some of those things. Um, And then the other way is, I think, more interpersonally within my company. So we still try to do socialization through happy hours and different things like that. And um, I try to go to all of them, in part just because I really enjoy my coworkers and it's also just nice to see people and have a break. And one of the things I've heard from that, there are, are several people who I've talked to during these happy hours, you said, you know, we've never had a chance to talk before. And, you know, this is really nice because our paths just didn't, don't cross professionally necessarily. Um, Like they don't have legal issues they have to bring to me. um, And their line of business isn't directly related to anything specific that I'm doing. And yet we've been able to to chit chat, especially like some of our customer service representatives who um, I think for a while might have even been a little intimidated to, right. um, to talk and hang out and chat. And so I think one of, one of the ways that I've grown is just in recognizing the importance of connecting with people, connecting with everybody within the company, um, and making sure just to make myself available and approachable um, so that people know they can come to me and that, you know, there isn't there never is like a title or something that, that says, oh, you can't talk to that person with that title. Like, no, that's, that's not a thing. Like, come, let's chit chat. Let's whatever, it doesn't even have to be about work. And now you know, people are feeling comfortable with that. And I think it's some, it's, it goes along the lines of what I want to carry forward coming out of this is um, 
we've even said in some of these happy hours, we don't want it to be like the breakfast club where, you know, everyone gets together and shares and becomes buddies. And then they all go back to school and go their separate ways. Like, I don't want to see that happen when we're all back in the office again. I want to make sure that um, all of us are still keeping up with each other and grabbing coffee and having lunch and, and those kinds of things. Um, because those connections are really important now more than ever. So how do you think you're going to make that happen? Speaking of carrying it forward, like, yeah. uh, I think there's got to be a level of intention now because I, I personally am feeling all these things too, whether it be on my mm -hmm. kids, side, like you, I have, I parent a kid with special needs. So I'm learning stuff and whatever, yeah. you know, and I have all these thoughts around what I want, you know, how I'm growing, how I'm learning, but there's a piece that happens in every experience that we have as humans, we have these wants and desires, but if you don't pair them with intentions and action, they yeah. stay wants and desires, you know, and that's it. And wants and desires are needs that never get met. So to get a meet met, um, you know, what are your, uh, what are your intentions and actions? Like, you know, yeah, that's, you a good, that's a super good question. And in full candor, I don't think I've fully gotten there yet yeah. <laughs> in terms of like how to make it actually happen. Um, I will say that there are one of the things that we started to do before all this hit towards the end of last year was revamp the women's group within Clever Bridge. And um, that's proven to be a really good way for, for women throughout the organization to connect who ordinarily wouldn't have a chance to, to socialize in another way. And so um, a few of, of the people I've grown closer to throughout the COVID crisis are women who are in that group um, and now have talked about wanting to be more involved in that group. So I think, you know, that sort of thing, you know, having um, sort of set, um, I, I don't want to say formal, but formal-ish, like organizational get-togethers, um, it, it, it provides better accountability in terms of helping to, to foster those relationships versus, oh, let's get coffee sometime, right? Let's get coffee sometime doesn't happen. Happy. But let's meet at that clever women event on Thursday or let's, um, or let's grab coffee before that clever women happy hour, you know, that becomes something else. Like that's a different, that provides more accountability, more structure. Um, and so I think leveraging some of those more structured get togethers is something that I'm going to work on doing and, you know, making sure that I go to them, which I right. try to always anyway, because I enjoy them, but, but making an extra effort to, to really be involved in the social aspect uh, of the company. So one of the things I've been telling my, my legal clients, obviously with some caveats um, being on the, in the lawyer hat, but even my coaching clients, because there's a point, you remember this, there's a point in um, the legal profession, or I can't remember if this was around when you happened or not, but where they used to, where law firms and companies used to be very generous with, you know, a social event. There used to be a lot more social networking in business where there was always a happy hour. There was always a free lunch. There was always something. And, yeah. you know, and at some point, I think it was like, you know, we had the 9-11 contraction and we had the 2008, 2009 recession. And, yeah. you know, those things got cut and then businesses just start saying, you know what, maybe we don't need this, you know? So mm -hmm. I don't, I don't think I've ever seen it come back, but I think, for me, one of the things I've learned from this experience is that I really do need those connections. I do need those experiences. They really do make it, even in a professional setting, easier for me to do my job when I feel like I know the person I'm helping and I'm working with yeah. um, beyond just a chat box or email. So one thing I've been telling folks, like really businesses ought to rethink like in a structured way, how to bring back some of those social activities. They were cut out because they were viewed as counterproductive in some way they were viewed as uh, but if you do them well they actually are more productive because people employees are way less insubordinate to bosses they like um, you know clients are way more willing to take difficult news from a lawyer that they actually feel like has their best interest at heart like everybody does better when there actually is some level of human connection so maybe like wine and cheeses because um, everybody's worried about employees getting drunk um, yeah. <laughs> you know, so like, right, you know, for an hour, like, you know, happy mm -hmm. hours, an hour, not like 
for, you know, right. wine and cheese or, you know, something structured. Maybe you do bring in the speaker or some kind of conversation to make it where folks just don't sit there and slosh themselves the whole day. Right. But really having those kind of coffee hours, happy hours, um, social events, and seeing them as a way to kind of build connection and build camaraderie and build a team versus a, a cost center where you just, you know, throwing some, you know, frills at people trying to make yeah. them feel better about their crappy job, you know? <laughs> Like, right. We had something, I mean, we do a lot of social things at Cleverbridge for that reason. I mean, it's again, a very uh, young company and um, young, both in terms of the number of years we've been around and young in terms of our demographic of our employees. And so like I, I realized recently, um, much to my chagrin, I am the oldest female employee in the Chicago office. Yeah. So, <laughs> I was like, Ooh, okay. <laughs> but um, we did a team building for the finance, HR, and legal teams. We did a team building activity um, probably right before all this COVID stuff started, like a month before, where we went axe throwing. And that's super fun. I've done it a couple of times um, with other organizations. And it was a great way to build teams because you literally were on teams and you were competing against each other and it's fun and you trash talk. Um, and the other thing that turned out to be kind of nice about it is there was no drinking because you're not allowed to drink at the axe throwing place for right. like, hope obvious Thank reasons. God. And it, certainly you could go out for a cocktail afterwards, but it was late and we all needed to be at work relatively early the next day. So, so it was just one of those rare, because most of these events involve drinking, which I drink, that's you know, expected. And that's for me, not a, not, a, not a disincentive by any means. And in fact, for a lot of people, if there isn't gonna be alcohol, they're not gonna go. But there are ways of having those creative activities that don't necessarily revolve around something like drinking and you can do it in a way that is like maybe something that involves physical fitness or something that involves some kind of friendly competition you know escape rooms or those types of things it can be super fun have you ever done whirly ball you yes know? through kirkland actually because that yeah. was the ip outing uh yep. each summer that's the only time i've ever done it was uh several summers with kirkland but yep that's yeah. another one they're great. They're great little activities you could do where, you know, so I think sometimes they will let you drink, but not while you're doing it. Yeah. Um, but, you know, like where, well, yeah, you can do these fun stuff and they're still just as team building. They're still just as camaraderie building. Um, you know, people have to, you know, you have to work as teams and you have to get to know people to figure out how the team is going to work. Mm -hmm. So um, for me, like that's definitely one thing I'm going to look into in terms of carrying it forward because we have been doing more um, within my law firm. We've been doing more, um, shout out to EM3. We've been doing uh, more like virtual happy hours and stuff to mm -hmm. kind of get, because we just add a bunch of new people in Chicago and uh, trying to get them integrated. And uh, I don't want that to go away. So I'm like, you know, we really need to invest in finding ways to do this going forward in a way mm -hmm. where, you know, whether it's not drinking or not, where we can get that connection because, you know, trying to get folks to really kind of help you, you know, even when you're trying to get your partner, like you can't make them help you, you can't make a partner help you, right. you know, but they're more likely to take that last minute deal, that last minute call or step in and do something when you need it in an emergency basis that they actually like you. Right. And employees are way more likely to be loyal to a company or a business. Uh, when they when they feel invested in the people that they report to or the people running the company as well. So, yeah, that's that's it's valuable. It's there definitely is an ROI there. Well, I'm gonna let you go because apparently my dog has decided to butt in. He's down here somewhere. Aw, my dog's been over there. Too, heard a couple apparently. Of <laughs> but I am so glad we got a chance to connect and to do this. I'm so proud of seeing how you've grown as a Aww, lawyer and as a thanks. businesswoman. It makes me very, very happy. I wish I could be there in person. To oh, congratulate I know. you more. But you one will. day it will happen again. It will. And next time you get to Chicago, once we can all get on planes and all that, we'll have to make it happen for sure. Absolutely. But best of luck to you. Continue Thank success. Thank you. You and, too. Uh, I look forward to seeing you again real soon, somehow. Same somewhere. here. Thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this. It was super fun and just wonderful to see you. All right. Good. Be well, Lauren. I'll see you soon. Bye. Bye-bye.